Welcome back to the Lensless Photography Podcast. I am your host, Oliver Weininger. With me as usual is Andy Metcalf. And in this episode, we will be joined by Mitchell Richman, an amazing photographer and artist. Roll intro music. How are you doing, Mitch? I'm doing good. Thank you for uh, for having me on the podcast. Well, thank you for for coming. We're we're glad to to finally have you here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, it's been a long time coming. Yeah. And and how about you, Andy? How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing well. Uh, things are uh, things are good. You want to tell us the new toy that you just barely got? <laughs> so I have purchased the Canon RF mount 100 to 400. Uh, it's an f5.6 to 8, and it is incredibly sharp, despite not being an L-series lens, which I know I have an addiction problem there, but I've been very happy with it. It's very light, it's very sharp, and it's been an absolute ton of fun to shoot with this last uh, four or five days. Wow. Well, we'll have to play with it, and then maybe do a future episode that kind of gets more in, into detail about it. So... um this episode is is mainly just about Mitch. Um, so, Mitch, you want to explain how you know Andy and I? Well, um, just to add to the lore of Alan's camera, I used to work there uh, with these two bozos uh, <laughs> a few, like a year or so ago. I quit. You probably more than that now. Um, but yeah, I uh, I got in. Um, I was working there for probably two or three years. Um, and I started in between the times when Oliver was gone and then he came in and then, uh, yeah. And then I started with a, at a teeny tiny little shop with Andy, uh, before we moved to the big one. But, uh, yeah. And now we're just the best buds and we hang out and shoot. Yeah. But not very often. Not as often as we would like to. We yeah. used to do more. But, and, yeah. And so Mitch and I actually... When I used to, we used to both work at the real estate photography place right. together too. So yeah. we wouldn't really see each other, but except for on meetings, but we did real estate together. And then we, we quit about at the same time too. We did. Yeah. yeah. You got, you got employee of the month there. Yeah. And I never got my, never got my <laughs> reward. So, so I showed him what's up. <laughs> um, so Mitch, why don't you give us kind of an, an introduction on yourself? And then about your photography as well. Yeah. Um, my name is Mitchell Richmond. Um, not like the uh, 90s basketball player. But um, I am a photographer in Salt Lake City, Utah. And I'm also a, a filmmaker and an art director, an actor, and an, and an artist, uh, a savant, uh, sex appeal you name it. That's. <laughs> <laughs> I started in my like background. Background was in video. That's like where I have most of my education, albeit most of it's informal. But I I started in video um, and then realized that I wanted to do things more by myself. So I just took the path of uh, photography, and then me and Oliver went to um, the the college together, and we he finished his degree, but I didn't. Yeah, Mitch is actually the one that got me to start taking classes there because I was pretty unsure about it. But kind of seeing him progress in photography and everything kind of really convinced me to do it. Yeah. yeah. Well, for what it's worth, I quit school like when you guys were two years old. So. <laughs> <laughs> just, a, just a couple of dropouts we are. That's right. Um, but yeah, so I... I after uh, doing the photo program, I basically have the full education. I'm missing like a math class and one little tiny photo class. Um, but then I was doing photography for a long time. I was doing like real estate. I did uh, product stuff for like a medical company for a little while. Um, and then I uh, moved into doing fashion um, photography for like a local boutique company. Uh, and then just recently, uh like six months or so ago just left that to be freelancing full-time as a art director and 
gaffer. I just I work in movies and film. Yeah, that's what I do full time. So, so how's that been going? Being a full time freelance, kind of doing a mixture of stuff compared to being actually fully employed at a job. I really love it. Like I, it's it's definitely like the lifestyle that I like, just because it's it's you work a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, and then you have time to breathe. It's not like, and it's every single day is, is totally different, um, with like the different people you're working with, with the different jobs you're working with. And even within the the film world, you know, you have different, sometimes I'm just a set dresser sometimes and, uh, doing full like art direction, or sometimes I'm, uh, helping out on G and E with lighting or, you know, occasionally I'll get some photo gigs or I'll be doing DIT, um, that kind of stuff. So it's always different. Um, it keeps things exciting. It's a little scary because, like, like right now it's the slow season, and I don't have a lot of stuff lined up for the next couple <laughs> of months. Um, but um, we could always use you back at Allen's. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, uh, tell the boss to give me some, give me a raise, and I'll, I'll yeah. think about it. <laughs> so, uh, so, like so how how does I guess when you have a decent amount of work, how does the pay compare? to working great it's i i am like even though i haven't worked in like a week and a half i'm still consistently making way more money than i was anywhere else what would you say it's harder to get that money or it's it's different like it's um once once you get to the point where you're you're like booking um consistently um it just kind of like like you just show up and you do good work and you are nice to people and the work kind of comes to you, which yeah. is, which is kind of the best part. And it makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you're doing the right thing. So that's nice. Um, but it's, it's not super difficult to get work right now. It is just because there's, um, there's not a lot of work in the winter in Utah. Um, besides like Lindsay Lohan Christmas music, Christmas uh, movies. Um, that's like the only thing that's filming in Salt Lake right now. Uh, but other than that, that's it. Yeah. So, Andy's face is the face of he wants to be in that Lindsay Lohan oh, Christmas movie. I've heard great things. I've got a lot of friends who are working on it. Well, I think if we really want to, we could make our own. You're right. Yeah, we could get um, the other Lindsay Lohan that isn't in this one from The Parent Trap. You know. Yeah, but the twin. Yeah, the twin. <laughs> so uh, I'll take a cameo role. That's there we go. <laughs> so um, as you know, Andy and I are super big gear heads like we right. love photo gear so much you know we talk about it all the time always buying new stuff and you are quite the opposite yeah, of that. you don't care about it gear schmear at all and we that was one of the episodes was does gear really matter what did you guys land on our conclusion was no but kind of <laughs> <laughs> um, but what what gear do you use is what we want to know because i know what gear you use but i want you to tell everyone <clears throat> i use what do i use um i have for like my main photo and video uh body i have a sony a7r2 and i have two lenses for it right now i've got a tamron what is it 17 to 28 yeah that's the weird focal length uh 17 to 28 which is a super solid lens i i like it a lot and it's super lightweight and it's great and pretty I wish it went to 35, but it's, it is what it is. <laughs> um, and then I have an old uh, Canon FD 50 millimeter 1.4. So it's just an adapted film. Uh, and and which of those lenses do you use more? The 50. Yeah. So it's all manual, manual aperture, all that stuff. I own the same lens. And it's, it's, it's spot I think on. you sold me mine. I might have. Like, early days in Allen's. I'm pretty sure you did. And I love it. Thank you for that. Cause hey, it's the greatest thing I've ever shot with. That's the thing I love. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we were talking about is, um, my macro lens that I have, that I do for commercial stuff yeah. is a Nikon 55. Right. Major, the one where I have like three of them. Yeah. Um, and originally I started doing that because I saw your still life and commercial work that you do just with your old, cheap lens yeah it's, so it's good i mean it definitely like i wouldn't tell a beginner photographer to get one like you have to know what you're doing a little bit more but you know 
and people save are, way more money. Yeah, that's true. People pay me to, to, to use it. So that's good. I like it. Yeah. In the interest of trying to be like you guys with used gear, um, old film stuff, uh, I picked up a, a uh, Carl Zeiss uh, 200 millimeter F2.8. Uh, mm. It's a contacts mount, but I have an adapter you got for that, contacts though. to RF. But but the the difference is though is the lenses that Mitch and I are talking about. Top price are like eighty bucks. Yours is still a, <laughs> a very hey, nice lens. Two, well, that's how, true. How much was it? Two hundred and fifty dollars. Okay, well, that's I guess not that's bad. Too, no, right? that's that's pretty good. Uh, minus my discount, of course. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, you know, $185. Okay. That's uh, not that bad. Then. And, and it's, it is absolutely unbelievable how sharp and, and crisp and colorful that lens is. And I worry a little bit because it's manual focus and my eyes aren't great. I'm not real good at manual focus. Uh, set up that peaking baby. And, and, and I, I need to figure out which button I want to use for peaking and, and, and do that. But I was playing with it in the shop and I took a picture of one of my coworkers and, and you zoom in on it and it's just absolutely unbelievable what it's, uh, what it's capable of doing. And, you know, and, and it's, it's Zeiss glass. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of the king of the show. That uh yeah, my fifty um is I don't want to say loads sharper than Tamron, but it's it's noticeably sharper. I don't know what yeah. that says about Tamron. I think that that it, seventy twenty eight is is a pretty damn sharp it, lens. It's it's a wide angle too. So also it's there's that a yeah. wide angle zoom, and so it's harder to get uh, so, sharp. Mm-hmm. But and fifty is the easiest focal length to get really sharp. But still, for those of you that don't know, Mitch, Mitch does tons of product and still life stuff where at least he has done tons of that stuff yeah um and it's amazing it's some of the best still life stuff i've Thank seen you. it's really weird and kind of gross <laughs> stuff sometimes and we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit here but talk about now your lighting that you use for that too because this is kind of my hand in hand with your camera gear my lighting gear specifically yes. oh um what do i have i've got a couple uh promaster like 200 watt uh studio strobes the, the point is is they're not they're crappy, <laughs> <laughs> they're crappy ones. i think you yeah. got from andy i think i did too yeah um, thank you, andy, but again. they're they're um, they're not very good though no no they're not they're like really... they're not d1s or they're not promaster or anything like that um, nice promaster or sorry, not promaster. I meant to say pro photo. Um, pro photo. Yeah, they're not pro photo or anything like that. Um, it's the the level right below me, anywhere. <laughs> yes, I also the well the so I I've been uh, kind of when I've been doing a lot of I've have been doing a lot of uh, fashion photography lately as well, uh, working for a couple of like online brands, um, and I've been doing a lot of uh, like straight on flash photography, and I think my flash is newer that I use, which is just like a, it's not even a Sony flash. It's like a Canon or Nikon thing, but it has that center pin so I can fire it manually. And that's and it all works. I need. Yeah. Well, that's, and that's the thing about this, you know, and maybe the difference between me and what I use compared to uh, Mitchell and what he uses is I have this obsession with having the very nicest stuff where Mitchell can take, like some of the, I don't know, bottom of the barrel <laughs> type products and, 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 and equipment work. and makes, makes pieces of work that are just second to none. You know, there's a, there's a still life image hanging on the wall at my lab and Alan's camera. Also a very gross picture. And <laughs> with, well, it's like, eggs that are broken yeah um what's what's that piece called mitchell oh i don't it's i I didn't give any of them they're all like untitled number blank um yeah they're not called anything uh, but it's yeah we we just pulled it up on the computer right here oh yes there it is yeah so go go to mitchell's website mitchellrichmond.com m-i-t-c-h-e-l-l 
R I C H M O N D dot com. And then go to his um still lifes, his marmalade still lifes pictures and and it's the egg one. The egg one on the stairs. Yeah. Um well there's I think there's two egg ones, but there's yeah, it's it's just it's basically a photo of a bunch of groceries that have fallen out of a bag onto some concrete steps. And I don't I don't know. I mean I I shot that with that fifty millimeter lens and those dinky lights. Actually, I think that one in particular was just a bounce. I don't think I think it was natural. Okay. Um but uh, the rest of those are all but the happy. point is is Mitch has amazing stuff and really not very good gear. So it kind of shows that you know, for sure teaches Andy and I lesson that <laughs> gear really doesn't mean anything. It for yeah. sure has helps and it's nice to have, but you don't need to go spending out your money on the nicest. Right. Stuff. I think I think what like allows me to be able to do uh the kind of work that I do um with the not nicest gear is first of all is is that I have um a camera with so many megapixels. So like, you know, if you if you threw uh, that 50 millimeter lens on something with 18 megapixels or whatever, it's not going to be like you're not going to get everything you can get out of it. Right. Yeah. Whereas like like a piece of film, like 35 millimeter film, the only thing that's like stopping the resolution of it is the, the crystals in there. And it's way more than 42 megapixels or 50 or 60. I don't know the actual number, depending on the film grain, of course. Um, so they were the old film lenses are like, you know, they're they're meant to have higher resolutions than than that stuff. Interesting. Yeah. Um. So this kind of leads us in since we're here on your your page on the internet. Um, I kind of want to know what inspires. I've asked you about this before, but I've never gotten a clear answer. But what inspires some of your art series? And let's start with this one: Marmalade, A Still Life. Well, let me read the the caption on it as we were confined within our walls and life stood still the tables and dishes started to sing work in progress exhibition and book coming soon yeah um so that one and this this by far is my favorite stuff that you've done and i Thank think you. a lot of people would agree and we had a lighting teacher together that was very fond of this stuff too I know. Thank you. yeah um yeah i um this it's it was like it's tangentially inspired by the pandemic. Like it's it doesn't have anything to do with the pandemic at all because um, we were all kind of stuck in our houses all the time and confined in these little tiny spaces. Um, I just started to look at the same things every single day, but with different perspectives because I had to be staring at them and nothing else. I didn't have anything else to look at. I got sick of Netflix and Facebook, so I would just, you know, stare at um, the lights coming through the sun <laughs> on my breakfast or stuff like that. Um, and that's that's really what this like whole series is about. Is kind of is it's it's these objects that that tell a story, um, right? The one that you have pulled up right now is actually the one that started everything. Um, and the big the, the like real like genesis of this project was a, a Polaroid that I took of this picture. It's a, or of this scene, which is two hot dogs on white bread uh, next to a beer. Not just any hot dogs, but uh, they're vegan, hot vegan dogs. hot dogs. Yeah. Um, true. Uh, so I, I took a Polaroid of, of that, which was literally just what I was having for dinner. And I posted it on Reddit, I think. Um, and it like, it didn't like blow up. But I got a bunch of people being like, oh, my God, this is art. Oh, my, like, wow, this is so beautiful. Wow, I want to hang this on my wall. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, not like making fun of them using that voice. Or thank you for the kind words. <laughs> but, um, but I just was, like, so shocked at, like, like, what in the hell is it about a couple of hot dogs on white bread that is, like, evoking such a, such a strong response? Um, and so I just kind of used that to explore that. And it kind of led into a whole series that is that is about that. That's just like these moments in time that are um, kind of like in between things. You know, it's it's that's like the moment right after you cook the hot dog and you're about to sit down to dinner, and it's it feels like maybe the middle of summer, 
uh, maybe you've got a watermelon that you're about to cut afterwards. You know, it's, it's, it's fun. But it's also like there is that time and place of it being uh, created, which is like within the pandemic where there is like a lot moodier lighting and darkness and stuff like that. So it, it definitely reads, reads through. I think it, it's, to me, feels like proof of normalcy. Like, usually people that take a picture of their meal are trying to make it into, you know, the most beautiful thing, and, right. you know, and all of the nicest whatever. But this is hot dogs on white bread because you didn't have buns yeah yeah, because you didn't have hot dog buns and uh you know and and fortunately you had some beer and that kind of makes up for it and you know there's absolutely a story there about how life isn't perfect but you still have something there and there's some beauty within that imperfection of life Totally. Yeah. No, th- and that's, that's a really good way I think of articulating it because it totally is just like all of those photos are just, they are telling little stories of, of life, you know, they're entirely constructed by me. Like not a single one of those was there. They're, they're not like street photo candid kind of thing. Like it's, it's all been, everything is created. Set. So the scene um, with the broken eggs on the stairs that really feels to me like, like you're having a really horrible day yeah. and you're climbing the stairs and your grocery bag tears open and the eggs fall out of all things. He did that on purpose. And, <laughs> you know, and, and, and they bust open everywhere and, and make a giant mess. And it's just like the epitome of the worst day ever. No. Yeah. And that's like exactly the like vision of the idea that I had um, when I was going into that and not to like, toot my own horn but if it reads that well then it's like successful right so if, if definitely yeah, yeah. So. well and i mean art's subjective to the to the viewer anyway, right right yeah so, like i know a lot of people and oliver even said that, that a lot of this stuff's kind of gross that, that's what i was like because <laughs> yeah. several months ago maybe even a year ago i asked mitch i was like so what's this series like what is it just gross stuff <laughs> like, that's all i see it's just a bunch yeah. of gross stuff that's just because like... it's like like there's like a half-eaten sandwich there's another one where like it's a bunch of hair in a sink um and uh some like uneaten food some broken glasses some rotten oranges you know it's but it's it's little bits of life that that are beautiful that are unappreciated yeah you know? I, mitch just does a great job about you know adding just so much meaning to his photos. So I, I wanted to talk about another um, kind of series of photos that you did, mm-hmm. that you did a while ago, um, Post. Yes. Yeah, post. Um, that was like my first uh, first series, first book I ever did. Yeah, explain explain what, what it is, what it's all about. Um, so this kind of came together based on a photography assignment I had and it didn't have anything to do with what the final product came out but I was it was like a study of abstract photography and I had an like assignment to just go out take some abstract photos um, and so I just walked around downtown and I was shooting stuff and I noticed that there were just tons and tons of like staples and marks and posters and stuff on all of the uh, what are those things called the telephone, telephone poles. poles and just kind of like standing there looking at them i had like a moment where people probably thought i was on acid because i was just like standing there like <laughs> fixated on these things just like oh my god this is incredible this is beautiful just like every single little you know staple and nail um and every little piece of tape that has a little piece of paper ripped off um all of that is um kind of the story of like the city you know the city and the people who inherit it and you know whether it be their their dog that got lost and they were sad and going around putting up posters or maybe they're selling their motorcycle or you know having a yard sale or um have a missing loved one uh, or maybe they're throwing like some 
dope New Year's Eve party and they want all the boys to roll through. Um, I don't know who would do that, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's, it's just like the kind of stuff that you see like that, you know, um, that's, that's really cool and really telling um, and has, there's a lot of intention behind every single one of those marks left on the, on the poles. And I thought it was a, a cool uh, thing to explore. Um, and also there's a lot of paint on the poles for some reason. I don't a hundred percent know why. Looks cool. But I, yeah, I, I try to use, you know, this really aging paint to kind of use some color and add some, just make, like, use it as like a compositional element. So um, let me ask on, on this series, is this all as you found it? Uh, this or? is a hundred percent found. So in, in contrast yes. to Marmalade, which is 100% staged. Right. This is 100% this is real. How you found it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I love that Yeah, one. no. Nothing's, nothing's been altered on this stuff. It's uh, uh, ready-made. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just very unique, you know, just the abstract design it makes. And it's almost yeah. kind of like as you're explaining it, like it's almost like emotional, you know, like thinking it is. of like all the things yeah, the that more, people go through, you know, and, and it's whatnot, It's a really you know? interesting, like the more that you look at it, the more you start exploring ideas of like everything that could go into yeah. it and everything that has gone into it and it's like wow this is really sad for all of the things that are not yeah. good but then it's also like wow this is really happy maybe there's like a staple for like a wedding around the corner or like this next turn you know it's it, it's it's yeah. really beautiful and it's really like i don't know it's cool yeah again just very a lot of emotional yeah, so that book's for sale if anyone wants to go buy it. Yeah, go to go to Mitch's <laughs> website and you can pick up a copy that actually has all these these pictures printed in it. Um, but yeah, it's I have a copy myself. It's a it's a pretty awesome book. So and then I wanted to talk about another project that you're doing. This kind of mm-hmm. last of the projects I want to talk about. Seventy eight. Yes. The... So this is in the works right now this is work. it is in post-production so uh, explain what is 78 and when you click on it on his website we actually there's a the poster of it oh yeah we shot that this. We yeah shot together we can talk about this this is great um but um yeah, yeah, yeah what is 78 that's a that's a great so 78 it's not a photo project this is no a, oh sorry yeah a feature it, film. it is a, it's a feature film um that i wrote and directed um and acted in um, and for budgetary reasons, edited <laughs> and, <laughs> and did the thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, um, seventy eight is was also kind of spawned at the same time that the Marmalade series came about. Um, really early pandemic stuff. Yeah, I I um, remember us when because we worked at Allen's at the time. Yeah, and we we're we talked just about wanting to start doing more video stuff. I'm like, yeah, we just need to like start doing something. And then Mitch came to me one day and he's like, I have an idea. Yeah. And, and then I explained everything and sat at the counter and ignored everybody who walked in and wrote down my little leather booklet, the whole like outline for the thing. Um, and then I made all these guys come and shoot it with me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, it's a it's a film that was um, again. It's like it's tangentially related to the pandemic, and it it kind of is the story kind of revolves in a universe that is under similar circumstances. But yeah, so it it kind of revolves around these three characters who are trapped in a house for unexplained reasons um so it could just be kind of it's like just, a pandemic or it's kind of is what it is, you, is know? It just, you don't know you don't know what do you think it is that's how well i just <laughs> i relate it to that i relate yeah to COVID i mean it, it definitely kind of is like it's it's all house. totally inspired by covid and um that kind of stuff but it's it's these guys living in a house and it's a, a boyfriend girlfriend um and then this this odd man out and it is just kind of a story about um, being like the odd man out and and not having like a support system. Um, it's just this one character, Jack, watching 
Ja uh, that's Mitchell's character. This, yes. Jack. I'm trying to be humble, but yeah. <laughs> um, watching his roommates um, kind of being there for each other and having support and love and kind of giving each other the things that they need uh, while he doesn't have any of it. And so he kind of goes out and um, kind of just seeks that. So he, yeah, that's what he wants. And that's what it's about, more or less. Yeah, and it's also, a, I maybe I don't it's a, it's Watch a, the it's trailer. A, it's a psychological thriller. Yes, so a it's a psychological thriller, so yeah, you're going to go out it, of your mind watching That it. explanation was very, it sounded like a soap opera. Yeah, it sounded it, more um, like a drop. It, <laughs> but it's, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's got sure a lot of... For sure pretty crazy. It's got a lot of horror undertones. Yeah. If you're a fan of like, oh my God, I'm blanking. Uh, the body horror stuff. Um, like the fly or oh, yeah. possessor, um, or even, um, evil dead shining, that kind of stuff. If you're a fan of that, this is, yeah. for you. and you can, you can go watch his, uh, trailer on his website too. Yeah. But yeah, it was, uh, cause I, I did the gaffing yeah. and some you know, you acing gaff. on oh, yeah, it. You did. Um, and so it was just watching it kind of all as it's kind of been made and everything like that. It was. It was pretty exciting, and there was some scenes I remember of us recording and stuff like that, and it was pretty, pretty intense and stuff like that. And it was just, yeah. it was, because I've been on a few other sets with Mitch as well, but this one it was quite different, I feel like, and it was almost, you know, almost me as just, you know, standing on the side watching the actors kind of act everything else. It was almost like I was just there, like in it. It was very, I don't know very in, intense and good um but i'm extremely excited i get on mitch's case all the time like when's it coming out no. when's it coming out and he doesn't get yeah i was trying to get it out this summer um but then that was also when i kind of transitioned to freelance stuff and i've just been uh swamped uh working on on other sets since so i haven't had much time to work on post-production but i am slowing down i just bought a new computer we are in the we are in the heat right now of post-production so it's it's coming along hopefully i have a a date that i'm shooting for but i'm not telling anybody yeah don't tell <laughs> in case it doesn't happen again yeah um so i i was setting up a lot of lighting in that but it was all from your kind of art direction that you guided me on what you wanted and stuff like right that. It also has you know very similar lighting to that marmalade series yeah very it's contrasty kind of and um, how would you call it? I like to I like to describe my my mm -hmm. lighting style as like a vibrant noir. Yeah, so it's just like very colorful, deep shadows. Yeah, I I like it a lot, and and I want to I consider you when I think of lighting, I I think of you. So I, I oh, hope thank that, you. I, hope that's a <laughs> I appreciate you. Like, it. I, it I really is. do consider you like the master of lighting. Um, thank you even when I started doing commercial stuff and whatnot, that's, I would, or stuff just on my own, I would call Mitch up and be like, Hey Mitch, how do I light? Like I'm st stuck on a problem and I need to figure out how to light this better. And so Mitch has taught me a lot of Mitch and school, but have taught me both a lot about, you know, lighting, it taught me everything about it. Um, and so I kind of wanted to, to go in about like, why is lighting important? Light is everything. It's, you know, what, it's, do you do you remember what photography literally means? Uh, it just means like to capture light or something like that. Or writing with light. Writing, correct. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's cool. It's, I mean, lighting. Lighting really is everything, right? It's like, it, no matter what, you can't take a photo or you can't record video without light. Um, other than like without that you're just doing a podcast and what kind of lame person would do a podcast yeah, except yeah. For um, me and Andy. <laughs> <laughs> um or like it would just be like an audio play right without light and so you know light really allows you to shape your emotion and uh kind of what you're saying in the scene you know even though like even even down to like you know what time of day kind of affects the mood exactly that you're you're trying to go for you know if you're if you're having like a fun summery like 
drive, you're going to want to light it. So it's like, it's like a sunset drive because that's, that just like hits people right in their, their heart. And, and, you know, if it's a snowy cabin, you know, where somebody's proposing to each other in a, in a Jared commercial, um, you know, you're going to make it like a firelight kind of a thing. So it's, I don't know. Light is, light is, I think the most important thing yeah when you're doing photography and yeah and and that's a big um thing is composition versus light composition is it's well first you can't do one without the other right um but to me i've always thought lighting is more important even though i think most people disagree and say composition is more important for sure you need to set up your shot but if you don't have the right type of lighting in your shot then it kind of it loses a lot of the feeling of it. Yeah. I mean, the way that I typically light is um, I'll do most of my lighting before I set up my shot. So like if I, if I'm doing a still life or whatever, I'll, I'll dress the set um, and then I'll bring in my lights um, for like how I've envisioned that they're going to go. And maybe I'll have like, like if I'm kind of not, able to picture it very well um i'll have a camera up and just do like a wide of everything so i can just see how the light is affecting the scene um, but i typically don't frame anything up until we're um until i'm done lighting and like dialing yeah. the light and stuff like that so i think i mean i'm a psycho so i that might not work for everybody but that's that's kind of how i see things um i can see the and and absolutely understand the vision behind that like i you know like i think this is what i want to create Mm -hmm. um how am i going to light that and so you you know so you put lights in there where you're thinking that that's going to be and then you know you capture that whole scene and then some in the effort to you know to see if to see if your light is is painting the right story Exactly. Um, and then that's a really good way to phrase from it. From there, you can say, I want to capture this part of it. This is the piece of that story that I want to capture. Uh-huh. And then you can compose your shot. Right. You know, when your when your light is correct. You know, there's a lot of inspiration to me about about doing it that way and you know knowing how and you know that's really kind of the brilliance when it comes to Mitchell and lighting is that he has this understanding of of how to paint that picture with light mm-hmm. and then and then go in and and say okay this is the piece of that story that I want to tell and compose that little that little piece of it so there's this like there's this huge thing going on but Mitchell says this is the part of the story that that I'm here to tell. Right. Yeah, I think and I think that goes into like like I just have like a totally preferred focal length of 50 millimeters. Like that's just it's different for everybody. I think you you're, you're usually the longer lenses, mm, you're definitely wider lenses. Depends. Um, <laughs> unless you're landscape, I listened to the first episode. Oh, okay. <laughs> um but uh I think like going into like having a 50 millimeter, um, like you just kind of are tighter on things naturally. And so it like goes into that. Yeah. You know, you know, I don't don't know if I explained that very well, but. uh, No, I understand. So I think there's a lot of people that kind of get confused with, with lighting. Maybe they're kind of maybe a little confused what we're talking about. So we're mm-hmm. talking about strobe lighting using flashes and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Um, so what's kind of the differences or what would you say natural lighting versus strobes or artificial lighting kind of um, what do you prefer and kind of what explain some of the differences to us? I prefer artificial light that looks like real light. Um, that maybe not even real. I think, I don't think, I think I like kind of in the more surreal zone, but um, natural versus artificial. And I guess it's hard when you're doing studio stuff of a lot right. of what you do. Um, it's usually artificial light. There are some people that do natural light, mm-hmm. um, but you usually can tell that 
studio just looks a lot better but maybe like with portraits and stuff like that there's a for sure a lot more people that go off about natural light versus artificial yeah. or maybe like, not even portraits but just outdoor commercial photography i think i think it goes into kind of my um my viewpoint on like gear right is it's gear is like a tool basically i think if you're if you're like an artist a photographer a filmmaker um when you go out there should be at least a, a an intention of what you want right and as uh like an informed artist you should know the tools that you need to get that job done so if you know an oil painter goes out and you know takes all their paints to the ocean and they want to paint a beautiful blue thing and they don't have any blue paint you know i'm sure they could work around it and, and make a cool monochromatic abstract thing but if their intention is to create a crazy blue vibrant uh, seascape then they should have those tools those so yeah and so i think i think that goes into like the natural versus artificial where if you want to go out and take some really beautiful bridal photos and have really really big you know soft soft light then you're by all means like go out there uh you know just before sunset and bring a reflector and that's it um, but and, and that's the thing though is there's so many portrait photographers that won't even touch a strobe though. i think it's i think because i was the same way and that before. and i was too <laughs> i think strobes are really intimidating because you, it's hard to wrap your mind around it until you know until you've like worked around them a lot you know so like just because of the nature of it being a flash right you're you're blinded for a tenth of a second and then you can't see what's going on whereas like that's why i think a lot of photographers start off when they're lighting they do hot lights yeah they, they go for more continuous lights yeah because it's you get your you get your like immediate payoff or whatever where you can like see your thing and you can just adjust it in real time you don't have to take a photo and then adjust it which is like you know when you have the luxury um which is what's nice about having modeling lights um, because you can do that. But I think a lot of times if you, if you light enough, you get to the point where you don't really need a modeling light. Um, yeah. You kind of just know about the settings and about where you need it. Um, but um, I think that's where like a lot of people are just intimidated by lighting in general, because you're already like, especially if you're starting out, you're already fussing with your with your aperture and your shutter speed and your ISO, and I don't know what focal length I should be at, um, and I don't know how to create the blurry bokeh that everybody wants, you know. <laughs> it, but and then, so you're already learning all of that. You and it's a whole other beast to try and tackle yep, lighting. Sure so it's I think that's where a lot of the like strobe hate or whatever uh, that I've been it's that just I hear. The lack I don't know of if knowledge. it's like I don't know if it's in the real world but i used to hear it a lot at like allen's right, yeah the, the camera store so um but i think it's just it's not in a rude way i think it is just people being scared of tackling things that are a little intimidating yeah so i think yeah i think use lights learn them well but know that you don't need them yeah because i mean once you once you know how to use them perfectly, well, not perfectly, but yeah. good, then you realize when you don't need to use them. Right, not. yeah, and just know their place. You know? Usually most of the time, if I'm doing anything outdoor, is I will just do a mix. I'll use the sunlight to my mm -hmm. advantage and then use um, use a strobe to maybe highlight an area or right. something Right, yeah, like or that. just fill out the shadows yeah. or something like that. Um, yeah, totally. Lighting is, lighting is its own beast. That's a reason it really why is. in on a film set you have your camera crew and you have your GE, &E, which is your gaff and electric they're just doing lighting these guys are just doing cameras like it's it's a totally different thing and typically unless you're like a, a dp you're not crossing over yeah you know? and that's when i started um the photography program when i started the lighting classes especially like it blew my mind like i thought before i felt very comfortable in photography as in like i maybe felt maybe I wasn't progressing and I thought I, I was maybe a little stubborn and, and thought I was like, you know, knew everything and whatnot. And when I started doing those lighting classes, it just blew, blew my mind and kind of being with you too, 
but it was just like so many things. It's like, oh man, I have so much to learn. And I realize that too, still that yeah. I have so much to learn, but it's just like, you know, it's like learning photography all over again, but you totally. know, with life. I mean, yeah, same for me. I, I had like lit things before and I had used lights before and I had good grasp of concept, but the, the lighting class that I took, that we both took with the same professor, uh, really like changed the way I look at photography. It, um, and not only the way I look at photography, the way I look at light. Like, and it totally. sound, that, no, sound, no, that exactly. sounds so cheesy, but I will look at someone and I'll be like, oh, that's like a Rembrandt shadow or like something like that. And then like, it yeah. just happens instinctively. Like, doesn't matter where I'm at. Like I will notice lighting and I will like, I'll look the, at it for um, a second. And... One of the biggest things that um, I always notice and I think about like every single day um, is I hopefully, uh, he's cool with me saying this, but there's a, there was a, a particular section in the class where we were, we were talking about light and natural light and we we're talking about color theory, uh, which is very important. Everybody should know color theory I did all want the to time. talk to you a little bit about that too. Um, I'll, I'll, that's what I'll yell about. We got to turn the mic. Maybe, maybe we should do a different episode on <laughs> just color theory. Um, but color theory is super crazy important. Um, but we were talking about color theory and, and how to implement that into like the lighting. And uh, we walked outside, and it was sunsetty enough to where you're getting some pretty harsh light. Um, and he was just standing out there talking to everybody, and then he was like, "Okay, now just look at the color of the light that's coming down." And you just like like look at it and really, really look at it and notice the color, and notice how when you have just on the sidewalk. If you have light just pointing at the sidewalk that's direct, that's not going through anything, it's super, super white and super, not warm, but it's pretty warm. Um, and then even like a couple inches down, if you look at a shadowed area, like it's going through branches or you know somebody's standing there, um, it's super prominent in sunset, but it happens all the time. The shadows are like a beautiful, like the most beautiful teal blue, um, you'll ever see in your life. It just like once you notice the color of shadows and light, um, it changes how you look. Yeah, you know, one of the things that we hope to do with this podcast is is to help uh, new photographers, new people, you know, coming into photography to you know to be able to learn how to to do this sort of thing. Um, and and so the question for you with that is what advice would you have for someone who wants to get into photography? What should they do first, second, third? First? Or does not even necessarily need to be that. Just what, what's the biggest advice you have for, for new photographers? I think I, I think I have like a tiered answer to that. I think first and foremost, you need to know your gear. It's, it's boring. And it's frustrating to get to know like all your settings back, like to memorize your aperture and your shutter speeds and, and, ISO yeah. and all that stuff. It's boring, but it's really important. Like to get to the point where you can shoot without thinking about it um, is really, really crucial. And then after that, I think it's really, really important to, I don't want to say like study your, your history or whatever, but find your influences, whether it's it's modern or for me, it was a lot of like painters and kind of old school photographers, like in, in the OG uh, wet plate days, that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, find your influences and deconstruct how they do things. And if you can't figure out how they do things, uh, message them on Instagram if they're still around or you know, send them an email, um, that kind of thing, or ask other photographers who are maybe a little more technical skilled than you are, um, that kind of thing. I think both of those things, knowing your gear and understanding what you want will make you get what you want. A slogan that I just came up with right now. I love it. <laughs> right that Perfect. One down. Yeah. And so since we were talking a lot about lighting, what's, biggest thing you advise for someone trying to get into lighting um, same on, same on camera flash is overrated 
no, I love it now. That's like what I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm going for. I think uh, to get into lighting is, is a really similar answer to the last one is, is know your gear um, and know what you're trying and have a vision um, for what you're trying to do. That's perfect. Um, go watch movies, look at all the photos. Even if you're like a documentary photographer who um, thinks that you don't need to know lighting because you're good, you're just going out there on the streets and getting your photos and you don't need none of your gear. It's, it's go look at, um, you know, Dorothea Lang or, um, David those, Burnett. Yes. Yeah. Or even Henry, uh, Carter Brisson. I don't know if I said that right, but you know, look how they're using their light. Oh, Harry Callahan, documentary photographer. Fantastic. Uh, and the way that he uses light, know your influences, know your history and know how to use that. Well, thank you for for coming on and, and being here with us. This was this was fun, and it's actually interesting getting to to hear some of the stuff that I've actually never heard before. So, oh, really? Cool. Yeah. yeah, we hang out. So. Yeah, I don't get to just ramble like this all the time. Yeah, well, <laughs> I like it. Yeah, it it's it's great for me. I've I've sat mostly quiet. You know, this episode just maybe you know basking in the greatness of of mitchell and his his brilliance but but you know we don't always get a, a lot of chance to talk even with, it seems like every time he comes into the store i'm swamped with yeah. eight other people and i'm trying to help and don't get a lot of chance to just sit and you know i really enjoy learning from mitchell every time you know he would ha uh, before uh while he was still working there at allen's we would you know we had the studio oh, in the yeah. basement and we'd, shoot all the time. we'd shoot stuff and um and i would just kind of i'd watch in awe and try and learn everything that i could from the way mitch would set up lights and and the results that would come from it i'd love to have more of that i should probably go back to school but no uh, you can learn it on your own i've got old man you can now. Yeah. Yeah. school is nice because it's structured and there's like a there's a set a to b but youtube's pretty yeah. dope <laughs> yeah you can there's a lot of like paid tutorials and stuff like that totally too, that, that too lighting from yeah podcasts podcasts great to learn lighting you can totally, <laughs> totally <laughs> really see what they're talking of, about yeah. <laughs> yeah if you learn lighting on a podcast then you are set yeah okay well cool let's end it there um mitch andy thank you so much absolutely it's been great talking to both of you and absolutely. have a good evening uh follow me on instagram Oh yeah. Sorry. I totally forgot about that. Your contact info. So you, we said your website, I'm going to say it again. It's, or you say it. Uh, yeah, it's just Mitchell Richmond.com. M I T C H E L L R I C H M O N D.com. And remember, uh, make sure to look at Marmalade is still life post and watch the trailer for 78. Yeah. Coming soon. That's a thing that you could go look at. And then also, um, follow me on Instagram. It's just, uh, Metro Richmond as well, spelled the same way. I think there might be an underscore. Let's check really who, fast. Who knows? You, if you just type in his name, you'll find it. I'm not that popular, but <laughs> yes, it is. It is Mitchell underscore Richmond all over. Okay, the perfect. Um, yeah, I do a lot of things, um, and I don't post about them, but I'm trying to. So um, I'll try and keep up to date on there. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Mitch. Everyone go Thanks, check out guys. this stuff. It's amazing. Thanks. Okay. See you later. Peace. Right out.